Many patients who are having surgery for a cervical herniated disc ask me lots of questions about what's going to happen to them during surgery. So for that reason, I thought it would be really helpful if we did a walkthrough of the procedure. Now, I was fortunate enough to have a patient come into my office a few weeks ago who was a nurse. Her name is Katherine Westerman. So let's talk to Katherine before surgery, and you'll see the type of pain she's experiencing. You're a great candidate because, um, first of all, you're a nurse, right. and as so you have a medical background. Right. And secondly, you have a classic presentation of a hernia disc. I can see you're even holding your arm there. Yeah. You have not had surgery yet. <laughs> no. And um, I came in the room, you were actually leaning against the wall. Yeah. It was bothering you so much. Just tell, just tell us, what is it like? What are you feeling with the hernia disc? What are the symptoms that you have? Because you have no neck pain at all. It's no, really... I have no neck pain. I have pain running down my sh shoulder blade. It runs into my tricep, and then it runs down my arm gets very intense in the forearm and then goes down to my fingers and it's a numbness, tingling and pain. Right. And you've tried, it's been months, you've tried in medications, you've had injections, right. you've been to uh, a couple of orthopedic Plus, surgeons yes. already. You're fed up, right? You've right. I'm <laughs> fed up. I'm too young for this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we'll look at your, your MRI does show hernia disc at C6, C7 on the left. And I think you're, you're at the point now you've done everything we can do. you got to right. get it fixed. So, got to get it fixed. So, and I was told not to wait too long yeah. because then you could have a lot more problems. Yeah, so that's where we're at. So right. we'll move forward on that and we'll see how you do post-op, right. okay? thanks. Right, great. I'm not holding my arm anymore, yeah. right? So it's six days after surgery, how do you feel? What do you think of the whole experience? I think it was a great experience, really. I mean, it's unbelievable that I can even go back to work like a week after you had spine surgery. That's mm -hmm. unbelievable. So how do we get from that really painful preoperative condition to that happy and wonderful postoperative condition? It took a lot of people. It took over 100 people working together as a dedicated team to get that result. So once you've decided to have surgery, the next step is to get a date for surgery. You'll meet with a scheduler in the doctor's office and obtain a date for your surgery. After that, we need to do a few things before we can actually have the surgery. You'll need to have some lab work and preoperative testing done. You'll need to make sure that you have medical clearance from your primary care physician to make sure it's safe for you to have the surgery. And of course, obtain pre-certification from your insurance company to make sure they are okay with you having this surgery. Our goal is to do the surgery safely and efficiently and get you home quickly. We have a great team of people that are all on board and ready to help accomplish this. Who's in the team? We have an anesthesiologist, we have an x-ray tech, we have a co-surgeon, we have nurses, we have medical technicians who are in the operating room. All of these people are working together to make sure that we have the safest surgery with the best possible result. For any surgery that anybody's having, I think one of the scariest things is anesthesia. And people don't really even think about anesthesia, but we work with board certified anesthesiologists who are there throughout the entire case. Jeff Sherman is a very experienced anesthesiologist and I talked to him about doing the cervical hernia disc surgery. Well, since, since patients come in the same day of surgery now, as soon as we meet them and greet them and get the necessary information, the necessary consent forms, get everything in place so we're ready to go, we will sedate the patient in the area where they are situated, which is usually the holding area separate from the operating room. So I like to, and most of us like to, have the patient a little bit more relaxed through intravenous sedation by the time they get to the operating room itself. We personalize the amount of sedation we give. If we have a patient who comes in who's extremely anxious and says, doctor, I am so afraid, I really don't want to know anything or, 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 or see anything, even entering into the operating room, well, in that case, we'll give a heavier dose of sedation. So, so it can be tailored to the patient's state of mental uh, anxiety, let's put it that way. You know, there was a study a long time ago that showed that the relationship that you establish with the patient is probably more uh, anxiety relieving than the medications themselves. So it's not just the medication that we use to put the patient at ease. It's also the rapport that we develop with the patient when we go to see the patient and interview the patient, start the IV or do what we ever have to do. So that, that's the first stage. And if that's not enough, or then we supplement it with the, uh, with, with the Versed.
We feel it's very important that the patient be relaxed and have minimal anxiety before the surgery. And we can accomplish a lot of that through our relationship with the patient, through our team's relationship with the patient, and of course through the use of medications. Another really important part of our team is the nursing staff. Linda Bromberg is one of our circulating nurses and she's been working with us for years. My name is Linda Bromberg and uh, I'm here at White Plains Hospital for 21 years, 17 in the operating room. Kind of like, uh, without being too comical, chief cook and bottle washer. I really think that we like being able to take care of everything from stem to stern. And it means everything from orchestrating everyone on the team to being in place to the proper instrumentation, all the positioning techniques that we use in the rooms for the patient's safety, keeping them safe throughout the surgery, and then of course actually being in the surgery and making sure the entire process goes smoothly. And then there's the whole aspect of meeting the patient beforehand, making sure that all of the documentation and the patient's concerns, the educational process, everything there has been met and that everyone is as comfortable as possible going forward with it. So there's a tremendous checklist before the patient can even be brought from the holding area down to the operating room. The patient is seen by the surgeons, by the nurses, by the anesthesiologist, and by the monitoring technicians. Once everybody has given their okay, the patient will then be wheeled down to the operating room. This is usually a very comfortable time for the patient because we've already given some sedation, and most patients are very calm and in good spirits. Once the patient is brought into the operating room, everyone present will introduce themselves and we will start preparing the patient for the surgery. We have to put on the monitors that we're going to use to make sure that uh, everything we do uh, keeps the patient safe, safe and comfortable. Uh, for cervical uh, discectomies, we will use uh, standard monitoring is a blood pressure cuff, uh, a cardiogram, a pulse oximeter which monitors your oxygen, an end tidal CO2 monitor which uh, monitors uh, the amount uh, of ventilation that you have, and finally, and probably from the patient's point of view, most reassuring is something called a BIS monitor which goes right over on the forehead, and that actually is a, an indicator of how asleep the patient is, or probably more accurately, um, what's the patient's level of consciousness? The idea being that we want to be sure that the patient is not going to be awake and aware during the procedure. Besides the anesthesiologist providing monitoring, we also have a separate team in the operating room called neurophysiologists. Through the use of many electrodes going from the head to the toes, we're able to monitor the patient's spinal cord function throughout the entire surgery. Dr. Stern explains how this works. Neuromonitoring is something we integrate into all our cases. So if you walk into the operating room, you'll see a neurophysiologist sitting in front of a computer screen looking at dozens of little squiggles. Those squiggles represent electrical activity in the patient's nerves. In order to get that squiggle on the screen, the technician has to connect the computer in front of which he's sitting to the patient with wires. Those wires are called electrodes. My name is Terry Small. I'm a surgical neurophysiologist and I'm in the operating room. I'm monitoring your spine, your peripheral nerves electronically from start to finish. I function in a protective role for the patient in this way by being able to alert the surgeon if any changes happen in the waveforms that I'm looking at. So there are basically three types of monitoring that we do. In fancy words, there are SSEP, MEPs, and EMG. What it means really is just sensory, your motors, and your muscle activity. Because we work as a team, the patient is first, and we all have the same thing in mind. So we want to make sure that the patient is safe from start to finish. So I do my job, they do their job, and we all come together, and then the outcome is it's just better for the patient. Jack and I divide our labor in we made a commitment that one of us should always be with the patient throughout the entire operative experience. So Jack usually stands by the patient and keeps an eye on everything. There's a lot going on and anesthesia is being given to the patient, but it's nice to know that one of us is right there by the patient as a double check to make sure that everything is in order. While Jack's doing that, I'm usually checking the equipment and all the instrumentation to make sure that we're all set because once the surgery starts, we don't want any doubts that all our equipment is prepared and ready for the surgery. The surgeons are not the only ones within the operating room field. We have technicians such as Barry Crawford 
who troubleshoots and helps us make sure everything is lined up to be perfect when the implants are ready to be put in. My role really is not just to pass instruments or to clean instruments. My role really is to think ahead, like everyone in the room does. I'm here to troubleshoot with them. You know, there will be rarely any situation that arises in this operating room that we can't handle as far as your cervical fusion and, and your process, your healing process is concerned. And I have one question for you, Barry Crawford. Yeah. Are you ready for anything today? I'm ready for everything, every day. What happens if there, what happens if there's an earthquake? If there's an earthquake, then God knows best. <laughs> we joke about disasters happening, but actually it's not a joke, and it's something we think about all the time. We're always thinking, how can we make the surgery better? What can we do? What's going to happen? Any possible scenario. And just from our experience, we're pretty much ready for anything at this point. I think one of the reasons that we get such nice results and have such a low complication rate is because we adhere to that principle and can anticipate any type of adverse occurrence and are ready to deal with it. One of the tools that helps us make the surgery so safe is the microscope. We start off using loops, which are magnifying glasses attached to eyeglasses, and Dr. Stern actually uses a headlight as well. And then once we expose the wound, we use the microscope. Here you can see Barry draping the microscope with a plastic coating which is sterile so that we can actually introduce it right into the surgical field. We'll be using this microscope later on in the surgery. Operating rooms in general are kept at a very low temperature. There are two main reasons for that. One is to help control infection and the other is to keep the surgeons comfortable because we're covered with these heavy drapes and we're working pretty hard. One of the objectives is to keep the patient nice and warm during the surgery. It does make a big difference when you wake up from surgery and you're nice and warm as opposed to shivering and cold. In order to prevent that, we have a device called a bear hugger, which is a big air cushion blanket hooked up to a heating machine which pumps hot air covering the patient throughout the case. We always set that up before surgery and keep it running throughout the case. The next step is to prep the patient's neck for surgery. And the nurse takes a sponge with special cleaning solution and scrubs the neck to remove all the bacteria. While the nurse is doing this, Jack Stern and I take time to review the MRI scan one more time to confirm that we understand the appropriate level for surgery as well as where the herniated disc is we're going after. Good cervical surgery requires expert visualization. We don't have x-ray vision, but we've got really good x-ray machines and we've got super technicians who help us. My name is Oscar Sanchez. I've been working with Dr. Stern and Dr. Newbart for the last 21 years, performing radiological services for their surgery. Just from being here so many years, I'm able to know exactly what the surgeons need in any given situation. And I'm able to provide any possible angle or technique that's needed for cervical spine surgery. It's very precise and it, a lot of times it's a very small area they're working in and it has to show exactly what's going on there for them to proceed to provide the best results. We always take an x-ray before we start the surgery. This is so that we can make sure that our very small incision in the neck is directly in line with the disc level that we want to approach, the disc level that has the herniated disc. This allows us to keep the incision very small. So the initial x-ray is done before the skin incision is made, and in this x-ray we can see the disc level, we can see the size of the disc, we can see the anatomy of the spine before we even start. Now these surgeries are very technical, and the better planning you do, the better outcome you have. It's very, very simple. We want to take the disc out, and we want to put an implant in. In order to make sure that we have every option of implant available and lined up, we have someone like Eric Clavers, who is a technician from the company that makes these implants. He makes sure that all of the implants are lined up and ready and in perfect order for when we need them. He's in the operating room, but he's not scrubbed in. He doesn't touch the patients, has nothing to do with patient care, but he's there and ready to answer any questions we have and supply us with the equipment that we need. So we're there to answer any, uh, any questions uh, that could come up specifically regarding the, the instrumentation. And that's actually one of the reasons why I'm specifically wearing a red hat 
is because I have actually no patient contact whatsoever. So I'm there just to support the instrumentation and the rest of the spine team in direct regards to the instrumentation. I mean, with cervical surgery, um, it has become very complicated um, because the technologies have become uh, so advanced in order to uh, help the patients out. So uh, sometimes you never really know exactly what you're going to see until you're uh, involved in the surgery. And that's why it's so important to, uh, to work with, with a technician such as myself uh, that has, has the amount of experience that I do. You know, I think that it's very important that the team that you're working with is solely dedicated to spine uh, because there's so many intricate details to each surgery, um, the instrumentation, the different variables in a procedure. So I think that having that, that vast experience and, ha and, and, having that, and knowing that the whole team uh, is, a, is a tenured team, that they, we work together for such a long period of time, uh, brings a tremendous amount of value to the patient. And I think that can contribute uh, to, uh, to better results. In order to keep bacteria out of the spinal wound and decrease the chance of infection, we create what's called a sterile field and use sterile sheets to cover all parts of the patient that are not going to be directly involved with the surgery. The only part exposed will be the few inches of skin around the neck where we're going to make our incision. We've scrubbed the patient's neck and we've covered the patient completely and now we have to do the same thing to the surgeons. Okay, so this is scrubbing. I'm going to make sure our hands and arms are very, very, very clean. So we do this for an extended period of time before we even go into the operating room. It's a special cleansing soap. After I've scrubbed my hands, I come in and dry my hands and arms with a sterile towel and then very carefully, without contaminating myself, put on a sterile gown and sterile gloves. So we're almost ready to start the surgery, but just need to set up some final pieces of equipment in the surgical field. You're in such good hands. Um, the doctors that have worked with over the years, you know, Dr. Newmark and Stern in particular, everyone is incredibly thorough. Um, there isn't a certain, any particular member on the team that doesn't think about the entire holistic process of it. You know, our, from nerve monitoring, the folks that we work with there are, are, again, very thorough, and everyone is very good at letting them know what they're going to do, what's going to happen. There's lots of information throughout the entire process that we want to make sure you have so that you're as comfortable as possible. There's many times to ask as many questions as possible. Everyone's going to come, again, with their own certain set of circumstances, and we're providing the absolute safest environment possible. So one of the most important parts of the surgery is something that we call the timeout. The anesthesiologist says freeze, there's no talking, there's no motion, there's no fixing anything or moving. Everyone stops and looks at the head nurse. The head nurse goes through a list starting with the patient's name, what the procedure is, Going down the list, we introduce each other, we make sure no one's in the room that's not supposed to be there, we make sure we have the right patient, the right level, MRI scans are up, x-rays working. It's, it's like before a plane takes off, it's the final check, and then you get the go and you're allowed to take off. It's a very special time in every surgery, we do it for every case, we take it very seriously, but it's a way of ensuring that we're all set to go. Once we finish the timeout, the nurse gives us the green light and we start our surgery. So let's do a freeze frame on this video, just so I can go over with you one more time exactly who is involved with your surgery. So on either side of the patient, we have a surgeon. I'm on the left side in this photo as the orthopedic spine surgeon. Jack Stern is opposite me as the neurosurgeon. Behind him is Oscar, the x-ray tech. We have the anesthesiologist in the back, right near the patient's head. And closer to all the instruments is Barry, who is our OR tech. Off the field, we have Linda, who's a circulating nurse. We have Terry, who's doing the intraoperative monitoring. And we have one of the sales reps from the company supplying the instruments, who is not involved in the surgery itself, but there to provide support. That's our surgical team for the cervical disc replacement surgery. So now we're ready to start the procedure. But first, we have to address one issue that people always ask me about. And that is, should I have my surgery done by a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic surgeon? 
And the answer is, if you can have both, that's great. But whatever you do, make sure that your surgeon, either neuro or ortho, is a spine specialist. I work with Dr. Stern and have been doing so for 22 years. He's the neurosurgeon, I'm the orthopedic surgeon, and together we're what's called the neuro-ortho team. Neurosurgeons have been trained more in addressing the nerves and the spinal cord. Orthopedic surgeons are trained more in bone and fixation using screws, plates, and implants such as the artificial disc replacement. So now that we're ready to start the procedure, let's bring Dr. Stern into the discussion to hear about the neurosurgical approach to the herniated disc. So Jack, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to make the approach to the spine and, and even taking out the herniated disc? Um, the incision is usually quite small. Most people are unaware that the incision is in the front, not in the back. We localize exactly where I want the incision to be made before we start the surgery. So we come right down on the structures we're interested in. Most people are also unaware that the distance between the skin and the vertebrae is only about an inch. So it's just, actually I was telling people, you take your finger and you push and you can almost feel the bone right over here. It's right. not a big, we don't have to travel that far to get to where we're going. Exactly right. And, and the other thing that I know we both try to do is when we make the incision, we try to use one of the skin creases in the neck um, so that when we glue it at the end, which is right. what we do, it's very nice. You can barely see the, skin, the incision. And this would be a good time to even mention that it is surgery. There's always risks associated with every surgery. So if you're having this procedure, speak to your doctor to understand the risks, benefits, and alternatives to surgery. And even in this video, we show a patient who had a great result, but not all results are great. There are some risks. But typically, I think, you know, we, again, we've done thousands, I guess, at this point, we're getting really tremendous results. And uh, people, as a group, are very, very happy with it. So very soon after we make the incision, we put retractors in which hold all the exposure for us, and we bring in the microscope. And then we're actually looking through the microscope. And you can see the bone above the, the disc, the bone below the disc, and the disc itself. And deep to that inside is the herniated disc. So tell us what it's like actually removing the herniated disc fragment. The procedure itself uh, involves taking out the disc and then getting to the herniated disc part. So we start in the front and need to get to the back because the nerve's in the back. And so we usually make a little cubic, cube incision and then take out the disc material itself. Then under the microscope, as we're going further back, we get to that piece of herniated disc. And then with a tiny little clamp, um, you grab it and then you pull that piece out. And that's where everybody in the room goes, ah. So the disc and the disc fragment are now out and essentially the operation's finished except for one problem. We've created a defect where the disc used to be. There's a hole there now and we need to put something Space. into that into that hole. We have two choices. One is a disc replacement with a motion device. The other is a fusion device. Fusion devices are very small. They're called mini or micro plates and the motion devices have a little bit of motion to them and you can discuss with your doctor which one is better for you. Sometimes we use one, sometimes we use the other, and sometimes we do something called a hybrid where one level is fused and one level has motion. We now put the implant in, but we have to prepare the space for the implant. And to do that, we use rasps and a trial, and then put the implant in after that. So we have this set of tools here. These are called rasps, and they're trials. So if you look at the rasp, you can see that it's, it's, it's rough and that allows us to form the hole to fit in the disc space perfectly so that the cage will go into that hole perfectly. So we use these rasps for different sizes and we get it just to the right size and shape and then to make sure we go to a smooth, a smooth tool which is called the trial and then we are able to find just the right size for the cage that we want. And then you'll see on it is a little number and we have all the dimensions from this trial. We can pick the appropriate size implant and then put that in. And then we have the nurse open the implant. We always check the date and the, uh, to make sure it's not expired and it's the right size. And then for a fusion device, I'll fill it with bone. I get the bone from the area that you've decompressed. So it's what we call local bone right. graft. And put the bone graft into the cage and then put the cage in. And for a motion device, we'll do the same thing, so there'll be no bone graft involved. And then we're done. We'll take our final x-rays and close the wound. 
I like to close the wound with a what we call plastic surgery closure, and actually now we're using glue on the skin. There's no stitches or staples to remove after surgery. And then a, a Band-Aid on top of that, and, um, and then we move the patient off and wake them up from surgery. As the surgeon is finishing his operation, we're starting to lighten up the patient. And we time it such that as soon as he finishes, the patient wakes up within five or 10 minutes after the procedure is done. They're taken to the, the PACU or the recovery room, and we're still responsible for the patient's well-being at that point in time. So, you know, we are there working with the recovery room nurses to, to, to maintain the patient's uh, stability and, and comfort. After your surgery, you'll be wheeled into the recovery room where the PACU nurse will receive report from the operating room nurse and the anesthesiologist about your surgery. As a recovery room nurse, we understand that neck surgery is a big deal. One of your main concerns is pain. Everyone's pain is different, and we're gonna work with you to ensure that we can get your pain to a tolerable and comfortable level for you. We know what to expect. Um, we've been working with Dr. Stern and Newbart for so long and the anesthesiologist for so long that we have it down to a science at this point. You'll have one-on-one -on -one nursing care in the recovery room until you're stable. You'll be hooked up to uh, a lot of monitors and equipment to ensure that your safety is maintained in the recovery room post-op. We just have such a great team of anesthesiologists, surgeons, nurses who all work together to um, ensure that the patient has a great experience. So as soon as the surgery is done, we want to let the families know that it's that everything's okay. And actually, you have a habit of if the case is going long at all, you'll ask a nurse to go tell the family everything's okay. Because I think people do panic if you're more than ten minutes late out there, and it could be that we're just waiting for an X-ray. Right. Um, so you'll say, please call the family, which is nice. Um, but once the surgery's done, we both go out together and speak to the family. And um, I know for me, the first thing is people just want to know the patient's okay and surgery went okay, and then we can go into more of the details, which you usually tell them more about the the actual procedure itself. Right. You and I have been doing this for 22 years together, and I know for me, I still enjoy taking out that disc fragment with you. The whole thing really is elegant and gratifying not only in terms of the surgery itself, but gratifying in terms of how well the patients do. I mean, it's really a great surgical procedure. It's a great operation. Mm -hmm. Patients, I mean, so often patients get, you know, wake, are in the recovery room and say, well, my arm pain's gone, my hand numbness is gone. It's, it's just all around elegant and gratifying. Many years ago, anybody that even talked about having spine surgery was worried about being crippled for life because it was like, oh my God, they're going to operate on my back. Right. And that's so different now. There's such a fine recipe for everything from anesthesia to the way that the doctors retract to the positioning techniques that we use on the tables and the devices that surround them. All of that has become such a perfect recipe so that it's like, you know, it's going to be okay. It's going to be the very best possible scenario that that patient is going to have so that everything goes beautifully. So that concludes the cervical hernia disc surgery walkthrough. I tried to give you a behind the scenes view of what we're thinking and what happens to you when you come for this procedure. It's really not such a big procedure, and patients typically do really well. But let's not forget our patient, Katherine Westerman, and let's check on her now six days after her surgery. So it's six days after surgery, how do you feel? What do you think of the whole experience? I think it was a great experience, really. I mean, it's unbelievable that I can even go back to work like a week after you had spine surgery. That's mm. unbelievable. So was the surgery painful itself? No. No, no, I had one, when I came out of the operating room, I asked for pain medicine, right. once, slept, got up, went home. Wow, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. The arm pain, numbness, tingling. It's almost all gone. Yeah, okay, great. I mean, it's, I'm not even aware of it unless you talk, tell me about it. Yeah. You're off the medication today, you didn't have to take anything. anything today. Okay, good. So overall, the experience, I mean, if you, are you glad you had it done? Or I you... had to have it done, and yeah. I'm glad I came here to have yeah. it done. <laughs> and it, it, it took you a long time to have the surgery, um, but I think at the end, it's, you feel it's the right thing to do. Yeah, because in the beginning, I said, no way in heaven and hell am yeah. I having surgery. And then when you're in pain for six months, then you fought, sort of resign yourself to the fact that I got to get rid of this pain. Yeah. And to have it done this way and be like this a week later is unbelievable.
if you were to give advice to anybody who's thinking about it or to someone at home who's like scared of the idea of surgery, like what, what could you tell them? Don't wait so long so that you're going to get full recovery. Right. Great. Well, thanks very much. You're